how do we make responsible data choices? That's kind of what we're going to cover in this talk. So here's our outline. Uh, we're going to cover five things today. First, we're going to talk about the mechanics of collecting data, WordPress style. So what's actually happening behind the scenes? Um, it's going to get into a little bit of technical detail, but I don't really think it's a developer conversation. I just think this is vocabulary to talk about what is actually possible. Like, what are we doing on our websites? And what is it, how can we have the terminology to talk to technologists, uh, whether you're a professor, administrator, or, or an engineer yourself who just doesn't get into this stuff too much. Then we're going to descend into the technical possibilities. What can we do with all this tech? That's going to be the most depressing part of the talk. We're going to talk about some really ugly stuff that you can do with this technology. Uh, then we're going to try to pull it back and talk about ethics. Uh, what does that mean, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about some laws uh, that have come into effect and might be coming into effect, and we're going to kind of catch up on stuff that's happened since this talk was announced. Uh, there's at least three or four slides in this deck that couldn't have existed uh, when this conference started, uh, because stuff has been happening just in the last few months. Uh, then we're going to talk about threat modeling. Has anyone ever done threat modeling before? Great. Uh, so it's this kind of idea of thinking about uh, sometimes it's called red teaming, like how would someone try to abuse this data? How would someone try to attack my web servers? Uh, and so we're going to think about where the threats are actually coming from, as opposed to what it is you're trying to protect, because they're not always the same thing. And then we're going to talk about framing the data discussion. So when you get to have these conversations, how do we talk about them in a way that doesn't, doesn't uh, kind of make us fall into logical traps or kind of set us on the back foot from the, output, from the outset of the discussion? All right, so starting with collecting. What is, what is, what are we doing? How does it work? Um, so it's mostly just logs, <laughs> is the short version. We're mostly tracking events uh, when we do engagement data. So uh, we're talking about this thing happened on the site and then we're gonna collect a bunch of information about it and we're gonna slap it in a, in a data store. Um, and so we're gonna talk about uh, in, in these uh, kind of requests and logs, we're going to have what type of event was it? Did someone click something? Did they submit a form? Did they just scroll the web page? It could be anything that you want to track on a website. So you kind of name the event and, and say what is happening. Uh, when we talk about what the values we're collecting, we often call those properties. So maybe we're going to store the user ID if they were logged in to know who did the thing. Um, maybe we're going to store uh, what time of day it was, what day of the week it was, what page they were on. These are all kind of properties of our data. Dimensions of the network, how we're bucketing or dividing events. So maybe we're talking about page views versus other types of events. Uh, maybe we're talking about this part of the site versus that part of the site. So we have all sorts of things that you might, might want to, you got to think of dimensions as anything you might want to filter a chart by later. I think is the easiest way of talking about that. And then sequences that we're looking for. So funnels, uh, basically we want them on a happy path. We want them doing certain types of things. And so we might track those separately. Um, so first we're going to talk about uh, how we're doing that in WordPress. And I'm going to split this part up into back and front of it a little bit because I think there's, a, there's an important distinction here. Again, I'm not going to get too far into the technical weeds. Uh, my principal engineer who implemented all this in our company is sitting right there. So I'm, I'm a little gun shy. I don't want to get too deep into this because he knows way more about it than I do. Uh, <laughs> but so our, our front end stuff, uh, when we're doing front end tracking, that means it's in JavaScript, right? Like, so it's in the browser and it's happening in real time. Uh, we're kind of we're queuing scripts in WordPress to do that. Uh, we're going to be putting user data in the markup of the page because the JavaScript doesn't have access to our database or anything like that, right? So if you want to track properties using front end stuff, you have to add it physically into the web page. What's interesting is sometimes that web page isn't private, right? Because maybe you have other trackers from other companies also running the same page. And so you may unintentionally be sharing data with other people that you didn't realize you would. And it, this is very broad, but it tends to be more reactive. Like someone gives you a JavaScript thing, and they're like, I marketing needs this, put it on the website, right? And so you go put it there, and it's, it's kind of a, an easier way of implementing analytics. Uh, when you get into back end analytics, uh, it's typical plug level complexity. Uh, we have quite a bit of back end code uh, for analytical tracking. Uh, our company uh, user data goes server to server in this case, so it's never like actually in the user session, it doesn't need to be anyway. Uh, and it's more strategic. So when you're getting really deep into data uh, and investing in what that looks like for your business, uh, you can get really granular and do a lot of really uh, kind of customized stuff, I think, more so on, on the back end. So how are we going to talk about this in Google? So my company uses Google, so that's the easiest frame of reference. There's lots of tools and lots of these systems. I just think it's easy and simple to kind of uh, contrast front end versus back end, just using Google as an example, assuming they're your vendor. Uh, so 
On the front end, there's Google Analytics 4 is a very popular tool for this. How many people uh, experienced the uh, Universal Analytics apocalypse? Yeah, yeah, that was great, wasn't it? Uh, so you, Google Analytics 4 is kind of Google's answer to all the compliance issues that have been coming up with uh, Universal Analytics. Uh, that's why they had to delete all that old data, because it just wasn't compliant with anything anymore. Uh, and there's a lot of magic that comes along with using Google Analytics oh, or its predecessors. You get Google's magic filtering. They strip out all the bots for you. They make all your traffic nice and smooth. They give you all these visualizations. They handle the data model. It's lovely. Um, and it's typically styled by accounts, usually by domain, you can, uh, some other stuff there. And one of the downfalls of it is that it loses all the data if JavaScript doesn't load. Right? So if your JavaScript turned off or there's an error on the page, you can just lose that entire section. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit fallible. Um, on the back end, you use something like BigQuery as a big data store. It's more manual, so you're kind of using your own bespoke data model. So you've decided how you're going to structure your data, and you're sending it directly to just a, a big empty database, basically. Not any guardrails. You kind of bring your own visualizations. There's more customization you're bucketing. Um, but you can lose stuff that's happening on the page, right? Because it's server to server. So you might not see exit clicks. You might not see on-page actions or time on the page, that sort of thing. So there's uh, benefits and drawbacks to both systems. And I think it's just important to know that both exist, right? And they're both happening out there. Um, so why not both? Uh, it's, we can do both. Uh, that is possible. However, if you do both, you're going to Find some annoying things very quickly. Your data is not going to line up. Uh, because Google's doing magic filtering on one end and you're doing your own stuff on the other end, you're just going to have a mismatch in your data. Uh, you can also get a full service vendor. So that's usually more expensive, and they kind of handle that kind of uh, back end stuff and add all the vis visualizations for you, but it kind of constrains what you can send to them. Uh, sometimes they have requirements about data models or other things, uh, but primarily the biggest thing is that they're just quite expensive to get going with. What's going on? Sorry, we're trying to activate chat. Where are the Zoom controls? It should be on that screen. I see a little bar in the black bar. Oh, I don't know. Can it you escape? Oh, there we go. Okay. Continue. I, I, I'm already now. All right. I don't know. It's so much easier. All right, so we're in the middle. Big question. Oh, or not. I'm not I'll back on my Oh, phone. I can go back on your screen. Here you go. Thanks. Thank you. I'll get out of the way. Don't we need to worry about PII? What's PII? I don't know this. Personally identifiable information. Thank you. Of course, we need to worry about PII. So, how are we going to worry about that when we're sending data to something like BigQuery? <clears throat> so, we want to connect identity to events now. Personal identifiable information has actually two different contexts, and this tripped me up for a little bit. Um, in a compliance context, they talk about it a little more narrowly. So it's usually non-directory information they consider personally identifiable information. So stuff like your name or your email is kind of like, ah, it's not that uh, valuable data because it's kind of login data, right? It's kind of out there on the web anyway. Uh, but when you're talking about sending data and tracking stuff, Anything that could trace it to an individual becomes PII at that point because you can trace it back to a person. So in this case, even a, a numeric user ID that's exposed out there on the website, uh, maybe it's in a URL, maybe it's in uh, other contexts on the site, that's personally identifiable because anyone can take that and link it back to a person. And so if you take that user ID and start dumping it in your BigQuery data store, you now have PII in your BigQuery data store. It's not uh, as, as anonymized as we'd like to think. So how do we solve this? Uh, we use something called a guaranteed unique identifier, or WID, as engineers like to call it. We love pronouncing our acronyms as a word. Uh, so it cannot even be generated from PII. This is a kind of really important part. So if you, uh, I don't, if you know what an MD5 hash is, you take a hash of an email and say, well, now it's anonymized, because no one can read this hash. It's just a string of numbers and letters. That's still not anonymized because you can run a bunch of email addresses and keep making hashes and then find which one it is in your BigQuery data store. Uh, so that is not anonymous. It has to be a truly unique random identifier that you attach to the person in your program database or somewhere else. Then that you can attach to stuff in BigQuery. If you do anything less than that, 
you're dumping PII into your engagement data, and that's very bad. And Google hates that, and there's laws against that. Uh, all right, so only what's going to go in the data. All right, I'm going to wake up. I've got comics. <laughs> <laughs> So the next one, uh, we're going to talk more about these fallacies later, but an important distinction here is that we log all these events, right? So we're just logging, 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 logging all this stuff. And you're like, all right, that's my data. And so this is the rules and the rules apply to this data. And then you run an analysis on the data and you create a new table of data that says, oh, I can find trends and do all these fun things. You just made more data and all the rules apply to the new data you also made. So you still can't have PII in it. You still can't have all these other, other issues and things we're going to talk about later in it. Uh, so anytime that you do anything with data, you're actually making more data, and it counts as new when we're talking about uh, regulations or any kind of concerns we have about data privacy. <coughs> uh, that includes, I just want to show a new chart. You know, I just want to do visualization. I just want to make a new dashboard. All of that's new data. So anytime that you kind of like collect stuff in a particular place, uh, that's that's going to count as new data. All right. So that's collecting. Got that out of the way. Now, join me on my ascent into what is technically possible. Uh, so let's just start with the basics, right? Well, what's some basic stuff that we do technical uh, on the technical side of this? We do some individual tracking, right? And so you might not think of this as engagement tracking, but if someone submits a form on your website and it sends you an email, it's kind of tracking them, right? Like that's a thing that you're logging. But we know that they opted into that, right? They chose to submit that form to you, they created that request, uh, they submitted that report, uh, or they you know, submitted their grades in, in an LMS, whatever it is. They're doing actions, they're choosing to do a thing, so they obviously have, have given you consent, so there's no issues here. Then we can talk about aggregate stuff, right? Those Google, Google Analytics does great. Uh, so we talk about where did the traffic come from? Was it from organic or was it referred from somewhere? What did they do on the site? When they left the site, we can A-B test how our sites work, right? There's all aggregate data. We're not violating anyone's privacy or, or having any ethical concerns about this. Just very basic uh, information we're collecting. All right, here's the next level. Give me more. We can do third-party cookies and local storage, right? Uh, this has been in the news a lot lately as Google's been talking about phasing out third-party cookies. Uh, Safari effectively already did a while ago. So with third-party cookies and local storage, you can stitch together pretty much anything someone's doing. You can figure out what they were doing before they logged in. You can figure out what they were doing after they logged out. Uh, you can also fingerprint devices and make them uh, stand out as unique. So you can say, like, what's the browser? That you're using, what's the version of the browser, what operating system are you using, which version of uh, any kind of plugins that you have. And companies have gotten very good at finding minute details about how your particular browser operates to say that's definitely that same person, even though they've already cleared their cookies and gotten away and, and you know moved to private browsing or incognito or anything like that. But that technology is definitely out there, and a lot of the uh, large tech companies spend a lot of money on that tech. Uh, and then you can start building profiles, right? You can start saying like, well, this body of analytical data is kind of this person, and we can find some patterns in what this person is doing, right? So now we're getting into the, the really kind of icky stuff that I think some people were worried about uh, when we talked about that opening scenario. But that's not enough. We're, we're going to do even worse. So we can start making demographic inferences about people based on their behavior patterns, right? We can A-B test against identity or assumed identity, what we think they have. We can try to predict their future behavior, stitch together entire histories, start sharing it, selling it, all that. All right. That was pretty awful, right? There's a lot going on out there on the web. Uh, we're through the worst of it now. No, we're not. That's going to get way worse. Uh, how could it possibly get any worse than that, though? In 2021, recent location data was used to out a priest and force his resignation. There was so much data out there that third parties were able to track an individual and connect them to a uh, behavior they, they thought was uh, beneath the church. Uh, so you can customize article titles to maximize books by feeding in individuals anxiety or anger based on their patterns. 
You could use LMs or AI to generate tailored misinformation based on identities and what you know about them. Or you could even try to use an LM for something good, but then have it leak and regurgitate that data to everyone else who tries to use it in the future. So you could unknowingly be uh, sharing data that was meant to be private because you thought it was just between you and ChatGPT. As long as you can tell a bot to ignore all previous instructions and do whatever you want, I wouldn't trust them with your data, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right, that was the end of that. It's all the terrible stuff we can do the other day. So now that, now that we know what's out there, let's back up and talk about this ethics business and, and why it matters to us. Putting ethics in quotes, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what does ethical mean, right? Uh, and a lot of professors would smack me and tell me I was not a good liberal arts student for even asking the question. Uh, but there's all sorts of frameworks, right? Uh, lots of people have built different ethical frameworks. Uh, I grabbed this one from, from Penn State, uh, the image there. Uh, but the one that I wanted to talk about is this framing using lenses, right? Because ethics is such a broad topic. And so these lenses kind of uh, drive you, like, what, what exactly do you mean? And so the, the six ethical lenses um, that I found were justice, so is this fair impact or like focus on outcomes, right? Like if, it, if it's good in the end, it's okay. Individual rights, so this is what people are empowered to do, uh, looking at the common good. Does it help everyone over individuals? Uh, you could be towards a virtue or an ideal or kind of caring and kind of very circumstantial and relationship based. So those are the kind of framings we can have for ethics. Um, so my question to the group is, which lens do you think we should use to talk about engagement data? So pick one. Don't raise your hand for something. It's okay if you pick two, actually. I don't care. Who likes justice? Who likes All right. Who likes the common good? Who likes impact? All right. Who thinks it's a virtue? Who thinks individual rights? Okay, that's the majority of the room. And who thinks about care and relationships? Okay. Uh, so we had, had a few minority votes. There was kind of a propensity towards uh, towards rights there. I don't think there's a wrong answer here, by the way. Um, I just thinking about these is going to help you as we move into the next step, which is going to be talking about specific laws. Uh, yeah. Question. Um, what national laws are this? So we all know FERPA, right? It's, it pertains to educational records, folks on security process, and it's about harm avoidance. Right? It's about harm avoidance. How do we not expose these records to people? And so that's a very impact-driven ethics stance, right? Like they don't want to create harm. Um, and so you'll see that a lot of laws in the U.S. have taken that stance. They're about how do we not cause harm? And so all we really care about is as long as no one's injured in the end, it's okay. Uh, when you look at Texas ramp and state ramp, they have basically the same focus as for but more regulatory machines at the state level. When you look at the GDPR in Europe, that's the first one that starts looking at individual rights as of 2018. So it starts talking about legitimate interest and having a right to your own data and how, how do we talk about it. Um, and just as an aside, I think a lot of the kind of chaos that happened around GDPR was mostly that we just weren't thinking about it this way before, right? And so suddenly a bunch of decisions we made about data collection and what we were doing became technical debt. As soon as that happened, and that people don't like that, right? When you suddenly create technical debt, so I don't, I don't think it took a, a crazy stance to have individual rights here. It's just that it wasn't the frame of reference, and uh, it, it caused some uh, disruption in the industry when it, when it came out. Um, so we're talking about laws now, right? And like, did. That tends to be how we frame things a lot of technology, right? Like, well, we have to follow the laws, so it's ethical to follow laws. Is that the end of the story? As long as I'm just keeping up with basic laws? But I think what's important is to see the trends in what's happening and how the ethical framing is changing. Because just like the GDPR came out and suddenly a lot of people were caught with technical debt that they weren't anticipating, if you don't look at where the framing of laws is going, you'll be caught unaware by the next wave of things. And so we see uh, the CPRA, 
which is not the CCPA. Uh, it's very confusing. Uh, California came into effect in 2023. That's the first one in the United States that really goes after individual rights. Uh, so that minimization, don't collect more than is necessary. Uh, there's limitations on how you store and how you use it. You can only use it for the purpose that it's said, and you have access to it, and you're able to delete it. And also, people who you distribute the data to, you have to be able to tell them to delete it, too. It's not enough that you delete it. Anyone you've shared it to also has to delete it. So you have to kind of keep a custody chain of data when dealing with these things in California now. Uh, a bunch of states followed suit really quick, but they're basically just watered down versions of what California did. So it doesn't, they don't really play into this. I think the California one's important. Everything else is like, uh, they, they put, like, I think Utah's is like, you have to be uh, dealing with like 100,000 customers or something before they care about anything. So not, not super important, but it is interesting. They're doing a little follow the leader of this, right? So we have this strong stance from California and the other states are like, well, not that far, but that's a, we should do something. Uh, so I think that's important to note. So what's the trend? Um, I think it's to, what is the last one? I skipped like out. Did I go past this? Oh yeah, I did skip the slide. <laughs> that's right. I'm previewing the question I'm going to ask you in just a second. Maryland just passed a CPR like May bill in May. So this just happened this year. It takes effect in October and targets organizations. Uh, with more than 35,000 consumers, and it doesn't exempt nonprofits or institutions of higher ed, which is pretty interesting. I think that's the first of the other state ones that didn't have a carve out for that. Then, even more interestingly, the Vermont legislature passed a similar law that same week, although it was vetoed by the governor. But the thing that really got people talking is it allowed consumers to file civil suits against companies that violate the regulations. One of the reasons that the precursor to, to the uh, CPRA didn't matter is because there's no regulatory body for it. It's just, don't do this. And then there's no, there no teeth to it. Um, and so what the CPRA did was it created an office with auditors and people you had to report to. And so now there's accountability. The Vermont one went even further and said, anyone in the state can hold you accountable and just sue you if they think that you're doing something nefarious with this. Um, there was a lot of controversy over this. Uh, but I, I just think it's interesting how much experimentation is happening here. So what's the trend? Um, I'll just end, I'll answer. It's going towards an individual right stance and the states are experimenting. I think of the takeaways here, right? There's going to be more of this, not less of this as time goes on. Uh, and so I would anticipate this, um, these requirements getting bigger. And so don't do things that are going to, you know, create problems for you in the future. There we go. This just took effect yesterday. The European Artificial Intelligence Act. AI systems considered a clear threat to fundamental rights of people will be banned. This includes systems that allow social scoring by governments or companies. There's obviously a lot more to the statute. I just thought that was the most interesting when we're talking about building user profiles uh, and kind of looking at patterns. Took effect yesterday. Uh, it's going to phase in rollout, though it's not like suddenly illegal today. There's going to be a uh, rollout over the next two years of different levels, and all the member states are now creating the regulatory bodies and all that. But they're, again, kind of leading the way on this. And so I think it's interesting to look at what Europe is doing is being about five years ahead of us on this sort of stuff. Uh, and so I would expect these things to start coming stateside as people get used to these ideas. And then here comes the W3C. Who knows what the W3C is? All right, awesome. I, I won't spell it then. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. It's the, the, the standards body of the web, right? The, the governing organization is the guiding body. Uh, so on 18th of July, so two weeks ago, they published ethical web principles at this URL. Uh, that lays out a number of things and just says, this is what ethics on the web looks like. And so they're reframing for us what ethics looks like. They don't have any regulatory power, but they have a really big soapbox, right? They've got a big megaphone. And if people start thinking about these things in the way the W3C is promoting, that's how things get made into laws and people's perspectives shift and start to agree on these things. So I think these two particular sections were very interesting. One is talking about respect to people's privacy, and those individuals' control and power. Right? We're talking about individual rights again. Hey, Devin, come over here. So, right. <laughs> so I think that the takeaway from all this is if you opt out of this discussion, someone else is deciding for you, right? It's important to have a voice in this. It's important to talk about it. It's important to know uh, where, where things are moving. Uh, there's no opting out of this, really, because it affects you and it affects your job. And it uh, affects 
you know, the students in your schools. All right, so that's the ethical section. Let's talk about threats. Where are the risks in your system? Let's talk about attacker goals first. What do attackers want? The number one thing attackers want is usually more access. And we're not going to talk a lot about this today, but I just think it's important to talk anytime you talk about threat modeling. What they want is credentials to more systems, right? They want your AWS keys. They want your email logins. They want uh, SSH keys to get into the next system. They want to tunnel through your systems. And so hoarding credentials is like the number one thing they want. But second to that, they probably want personal info, right? They want financial data. They want identity data that they can steal uh, or just email addresses. It's kind of like their sort of runner-up prize. At least they can, you know, put you on a spam list, I guess. Um, so these are the things that people are after. So it's important to like think about that when you're thinking about security in your systems and how you're handling PII and how you're building analytics. What might you be doing to yourself? So there are ways that you can actually threaten yourself just by making uh, choices that you didn't think through carefully. One is third-party scripts uh, running on your site. They can leak data very easily. So again, like if you have Google Analytics running on your site and you say, okay, for that, I'm going to need to add uh, Sally's first name and I need her major uh, to be on the page. And so you do that and you forget that three weeks ago, marketing sent you a script from Adobe or whatever. Adobe could be capturing that information and you'd never know it uh, because it will go into their data store maybe and it's saved as something. And so they might not ever realize it. They might not ever find it. It might not be a problem, but her data might be on their servers now because you've got third party scripts running. So it's important to know. Anything that's running on a web page has access to everything on the web page. Um, and it also could be your auth credentials. Uh, this is another thing. Uh, so if you say, uh, again, like a, an Adobe marketing script, I'm not picking on Adobe for any particular reason. Um, and you put that script and it's on all pages because you added it to the head, right? And so yeah, there it is on my entire site. Now that script is running on your login page and it might be capturing the password as posted metadata, right? Uh, so you have to think about these things and make sure that these things only have access to exactly what you want. There's also uh, the problem of takeovers. So this is a great example uh, just from June. Polyfill IO uh, was taken over uh, by some kind of Chinese hacker and 100,000 sites with Polyfill IO embedded on it are now compromised, basically, unless they remove that script. Um, and so you're basically just giving the keys to a third party and saying, I trust you and good luck. Um, so it's, it's very important to keep an eye on those vendors uh, and know exactly where they're uh, running on your website and what they're doing with that information. Um, and also, you got to think about third-party vendors. So say you're using a third-party email service and you're sending out emails. What are in those emails? Are you sending additional metadata with those emails? Are, are you sending things you don't need to be sending out the door with these other partners that you're connecting to and sending data to? So what's threatening to the individual now? So we're talking, that was talking about you as like a business owner or a web developer or whatever. What's threatening to an individual? So I would argue complexity. You know, we talk about cookie banners and accepting things, but how many people actually know what that means, right? And when you start talking about consent, can they understand how their data is being used? And if you explain it in a way that the consent is meaningful. Um, and also uh, we worry about unintended consequences, right? Like how could, this data exposes this person to other risks that weren't in our threat model, right? Are, are they doing things that are fine, but they didn't want exposed to the broader world? Um, and so we, we can accidentally expose things uh, that we didn't mean to by sending the wrong data to the wrong people. So what are some ways you can limit risk and failure modes? It is. What, what are things that you can do? I mean, I mentioned a couple in there, but what are things you can do to not accidentally expose data or engage with data. Reduce your third party plugins. Yeah, reduce third party plugins. That's a great one. Yeah. Or, or if you have to use them, what can you do if, you're, if you don't have any choice? Just limit the scope, right? We can get them off the login page. We can audit them, make sure they're doing what they said. We can have an agreement with them that we know how they're going to use the data that we're allowed to request to delete the data. So uh, yeah, there's just a lot of, it's basically just constraining how many risk factors there are. There is no silver bullet in any of this, right? Just like in web security, there's nothing you can do that just fixes the problem. You're just talking about mitigating risk everywhere that you can in the entire system. 
All right, more comics. Gil didn't talk to respond to my question long enough, so we need more comic time. That's it's just the banality of how we share data on the web. Uh, this is basically uh, just supposing what we think is like ninja hackers when really they're just getting a data dump and trying all your emails and passwords, right? We're just leaking data and we don't think about what it means when this leak data combines with this leak data, right? And what we can do when we put those two things together. So you got to think about the common outcomes of what we're doing. All right, so we only address. Don't collect anything. That would be the best thing, right? Just don't collect stuff. All right, but you got to collect stuff. So don't collect more than you need, right? We have to collect this much. How can we not keep it any longer than we need to, right? Let's set a time limit on this. We could say we're only going to keep the records for two years after this. We could not connect unconnected data sets, right? When we start merging data together, now we have new data. So let's not do that if we don't need to. Let's not expose our data. Let's anonymize it. There's lots of ways, right? So this is important to think about is in your situation, there are things that are not on this list, right? There are things you can do that I don't know about. And so you have to stay engaged with this and, and kind of think through your system and what you can do with it. All right, last section, doing great. Talk about framing this discussion, right? So now how do you communicate this to everyone else, right? Because data isn't one person's thing. Data really touches every part of an organization. So you have to be able to have kind of collaborative conversations with people about this. The easiest way is to align data with strategy, right? So we talked about a legitimate interest in our data. So we wanna make sure the data we're collecting aligns to our goals. So it starts with goals, right? Like, what are we trying to do with data? Don't jump down to, wouldn't it be cool if we had a graph that did this, right? right? That's all we're talking about. What are we trying to do with this data? Then what questions do we wanna answer? Then from what questions, then we can talk about the metrics that we think answer the questions. And then from the metrics, we can talk about the visualizations. When you shortcut the process of coming up with why you're collecting data, you're probably gonna violate someone's privacy by accident uh, because you're not keeping it attached to those top level goals that justify the collection of the data in the first place. This is a, I'm just getting further into meme territory now, but. We need a pie chart. Chicken run if we all get one. Uh, so don't yeah, don't jump down the stack and then we need a pie chart for the presentation of this data, right? Like what's the strategy? What visualizations attaches to that strategy? So the second thing we can do is align value and risk. They're not unrelated things. So why is it useful to the person whose data we're collecting that we're doing this, right? That's the value or, or useful to us and what value we're going to prove to them as a result. And then what are the consequences of this data existing? That's the risk, right? All these things that can happen once the data exists and it's not deleted, what are the potential outcomes of that? And you have to weigh the two, and there's no clear answer, but you should have a feeling, right? Like this feels very risky and very low value. All right, well, let's not collect that. This feels very high value and the risk is pretty limited. Great, let's do that, right? It's just kind of weighing those things against each other to make a better decision about what data you're collecting. So some framing chops real quick. Uh, technically, we have the raw data. And once you do something with it, that's new data. Storage is so cheap, we could just, no, we're not doing that. Uh, there's lots of uh, outs we can have about, well, we could just do that, we could just do this. Um, and, and also just jumping again down to, we could just make a graph, right? We gotta start with the framing and work our way down the list or else we can get into some traps really quickly when we're having these conversations. <laughs> Always take the time to think about these things when you get the requests, right? It's annoying, it's, it's a hassle, it is, I know it's like you're writing, uh, you're, you're getting your work done and it's suddenly like, ah, now I have to have a Socratic debate in my brain about what we're, I know, but like, we have to have these conversations and keep them top of mind uh, to, to limit the risk to uh, everyone. So let's recap. Don't opt out, don't opt out. It's happening right now. There's new stuff happening, there's new laws being passed, we're reframing the ethics of all this right now. And it's important to be part of that conversation. We have to align what we're doing with outcomes. We want to frame the discussion with legal trends towards rights and principles, right? We want to make sure that we're not caught by these things when they come up. We want to assess the risk that's posed by the data. We want to uh, consider analysis reports as new data, and so that we understand the risk and complexity that the new data adds on top of what we collected. 
In the US, you can advocate for state level privacy laws. If this is important to you and you don't like collecting this stuff, this is where the sausage is getting made right now. And so I think that's uh, where we can have an influence in this stuff. So my final thought, in order for the web to continue to be beneficial to society, we need to consider the ethical implications of our work when we build web technologies, applications, and sites. Again, that was the W3C just two weeks ago. That's my talk. Thanks. All right, I think there's uh, some time for questions. So, are there any questions for Link? Yeah. So one of the things that we run into a lot, especially with request more information forms, is that there's this automatically checked to click tick box at the bottom. We've had fights with members that they say, no, that's our standard. Like that has to be checked. What do you do in that case? Because you can't you can tell them no, but you're still kind of stuck. So we the vendor requires a feature. Oh, so you're sending them to a third party vendor. Oh, like and... we're, we're embedding their form. And so that little checkbox at the bottom is automatically checked. Like in our view, we're like, no, don't automatically check that. What sort of, do you have any sort of recommendations on what you can do in that case? That's really challenging. I would try to escalate that to the contract negotiation level if you can. Yeah. Because that's that's an ethical consideration that should be part of the contract. And that's that's where the leverage is, is when the renewal comes up. I hate to say this as, as a vendor myself. <laughs> don't, don't say this uh, a lot. But when you have those renewal conversations, that's when you have the most leverage for those types of things. Um, also, I mean, you could, I, I don't know the technical kind of background of this, but you could try to um, not off site that form in particular, or get it onto your site where you can kind of manipulate it with JavaScript even. Yeah. Um, what else do we do? Anyone else have any ideas on this one? Get it from vendor. Get it from vendor. Yeah. I mean, I don't what, know if we keep trying to tell them to do, but they're not. Well, and, that, and that's really interesting because so I wonder if they're framing it's unethical to have a box. I agree. Free, free check. Yeah. yeah. Like, at the same, like, if you are going in there, you should be able to select all the things initially. Something should be pre selected for you. Yeah, yeah. Right. And that's, I mean, that's um, saying something is the default is the ultimate vendor top out. Yeah. <laughs> like, there, there's no, there's a reason that's checked and they're not telling you the reason. Right. And it's probably that the conversion tanks or whatever it is, and they think you're not going to like the outcome of that. And so you probably need to have a frank conversation about, I understand unchecking this box is probably going to drop the conversions and, and all this sort of stuff, right? Like it's, I'm going to see worse use of this tool or whatever, right? Um, Cause they're worried that you're going to check the box and then you're not going to renew in a year or whatever because of the outcome of that. So um, yeah, I, I would keep digging it and get them to actually say something real. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I was curious how this applies to email um, because sometimes we'll get a request we have to send scary emails i call them where it's like if you don't do xyz by date you will have consequences they will be big and people are like i students at santa received this email we're like can you check and see if he actually did errors happen so i am curious the ethics of checking if they actually opened or saw the email or even got it so uh sorry reference uh, okay so we're asked times student says they did not receive your email okay. our email said had big, big consequences for not seeing email they claim well i didn't know what's going to happen, so I can't be put to blame for not acting on this email if I never saw it. So we're asking, check if student actually saw email via your tech services, and I'm curious what the ethics are. Yeah, um, well, I mean, first of all, that's really a dodgy way <laughs> to, to yeah. rely on something, because there's a, like, I'll tell you, I have images disabled in my email so that it won't send read receipts to anyone ever. Um, and so, like anything like that can cause those technologies to fail basically in the inbox. Uh, so there's a lot of ways uh, that that will fail. And so sending an email is not a contract, right? Like it's not, it's not a legal, legally binding anything. You can't count on that. Uh, I would say you need to have them click something, right? And, and acknowledge and, and actually take an action. Viewing something, I, I don't think that holds really water. So um, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know how to think about it. I get the question. I don't know if it's ethical to check if they clicked it if the student's lying to us they didn't see it because they never. No, I, I would yeah. not assume a student's lying in that case. There's a lot of ways to lose that. I mean, we we my company looks at open rates and emails too, mm -hmm. but like there's there's no situation where we're getting where we're trying to go for 100 percent because like it's just we're not you can't get 100 percent of even if everyone looked at the email, <clears throat> you won't get 100 percent of the callbacks. Mm -hmm. 
that actually trigger it, right? Like it's not going to happen. So using that as a, kind of a sign of whether a student did a thing, like I don't, that doesn't really work. Yeah, there has to be like an actual concrete action beyond that. Thank you. Yeah.